Hello everyone, this is a quick demonstration on how to use an autoencoder for dimensionality reduction and how to beat the performance of PCA for a two component output. An autoencoder looks approximately like this. Long story short, you have an input of n elements and you have an output of n elements. And in the encoder part, you step it down towards a bottleneck point, and in the decoder part, we step it up towards the uh, original size, which is also the size of the output layer. Over here, we have two components, and in the image, and this is also what I'm going to be doing in this example. Our data set is this, the Arrhythmia data set from UCL's repository. Uh, one thing I'd like to note about it is that some variables or features are binary, others are linear, some of them are angles in degrees, and some of them are straight up sequential. And I'm just using basically a feed forward net type of autoencoder. So we could, in theory, get much higher performance if we were to use something like an LSTM or something like that. But I just intentionally am keeping it basic and I accomplished my goal of outperforming PCA. All of my code can be found at github slash alip604 slash youtube. Alright, so here are my input statements. I use xgboost, light gbm, and catboost. These are all gradient boosting methods. And I input some pretty normal SKLearn stuff. Uh, this is all for the baselining. I basically got a few classifiers to run as a baseline so I know how my relative performance is going to be once I have my PCA versus the autoencoder. So I start off by loading up the data using loadmat from S scipy.io and I just unraveled the Y because it was nested. I computed the relative points of outliers, basically in outliers 1, so if I sum up all the elements, so zeros wouldn't contribute to this obviously, and I divide by the total number of data points, I would find out the percentage that I have of outliers, also known as the contamination. I run a quick for loop just to show the explained variance ratio of PCA across the different number of components. Basically, I take the PCA with I components, I fit it to my data, I get its explained variance ratio, I sum up all those ratios, and I print it with a number rounded to 5 decimal points. And I found that 75 were 75 components would give me an explained variance ratio of 95. I'm sorry, 0.99. I wrote this quick benchmark function. It takes in the x chain x test, y chain y test, a parameter for whether we want our data scaled, a parameter which is an integer for whether we want for whether you want and if so how many n components to have on our PCA and we give it a title and we give it verbose. Verbose will basically control whether we print out a plot ROC. This is from a custom package because this plot ROC allow us to plot it in our multi plot it when we have multiple uh, lines to make. I will display this in a moment. So basically, if scale, we scale our data. If PCA, well, if PCA is not none, we put one PCA over here, and we scale our data accordingly. We have five classifiers, and I have the n estimators pretty high and I have the n job set to negative 1 which is 
to utilize on my calls. I have a decently powerful computer so I can do this. If your computer is weak, you should probably leave it at default. Perhaps even for these two, have it a little less than the fault and estimators. I went through a loop of the set of all estimators, or well, this is technically a list, and I fit it, scored, put it out. I append the rankings to a list of rankings, which is just an ordered list, and I keep a list of the names of it because I'm doing a tiny bit of computation to find out the formal type of the classifier which would be like which at the which would be a bunch of stuff and at the end it would tell us let's say actually choose classifier I just split it by zeros get the last element strip off some unneeded underscores and that's how I programmatically get the name of an estimator so in a classifier. I'll do a little bit of math that I won't bother explaining to drop any subpar classifiers. In practice, it removes the weakest classifier. And I run this uh, back code ensemble vote classifier, which is from the following package mlxtrend.classifier. Basically, this allows me to have an ensemble voting classifier in which I can have refit equals to false. I don't want to do extra work. I don't have to. Now, I get the predictions, probabilities, and I just print out some basic metrics. In particular, I get, I print out the accuracy, and I print out the categorical cost entropy slash the log loss, which is defined by right here. I could print out the F1 score, but in practice it ends up being exactly what my accuracy is every single time, even though F1 score is defined as the following. And the Bose prints out the plot ROC. Uh, just for the sake of example, I will show the Bose. So this is what the ROC curve looks like. It shows it for class 1, for class 0, and it will show the micro average and the macro average. Alright, so I call this benchmark several times. I do it scale without scaling, without PCA, with scaling, without PCA without scaling with n components which explains which is the lowest number of n components when we are stepping down by 20 that still gives us a 99% explained variance ratio which is 73 in this case in other words we reduce our dimensionality from 273 down to just 73 and I saw it with scaling and with PCA. So our baseline without any scaling is 95 or 96% accuracy. And if we do have scaling, we lose 1% accuracy. Now, if we have no scaling and we have PCA, we will have 92% accuracy. Meanwhile, if we have scaling and PCA, we will have 90% accuracy. So, for the type of tree based methods that we're using right here, we actually find that scaling will actually reduce performance, uh, in particular standard scaling. Min-max scaling most likely would have marginal impact. And the thing is, this might be just due to the random state. I removed the random state for testing the autoencoder down below in which I used this code. But when I did use a random state, the spread between these was much less. So scaling when I have random state didn't matter very much. I'm just going to run this again just for the sake of example. Over here we find that scaling did actually made a small improvement. And scaling here actually 
didn't actually have an impact. So, when will scaling to a 99% explained variance ratio? It has a marginal impact. Sometimes it's better, sometimes it's worse, but on average, it's more or less the same. Now I ran some the same benchmark without scaling with PCA equals two, PCA equals two. So PCA one PCAs and components equals thirty, and components equals twenty, and with scaling. PC and components equals to so we got 94% accuracy meanwhile up here we were getting about 90% accuracy which is weird we have less components but we have higher accuracy which is like really weird but that's what I got and I'm quite confident there's not a bug in my code or anything like that and when we have PC equals 2 we get 85% accuracy and even if we have scaling we have 80% accuracy in my past testing I found out that this is not always the case now we scale our original data one more time because now we are no longer have encapsulated in our function so for the neural network I want everything to scale I do some basic imports with our uh, TensorFlow 2.0.chiras I define my autoencoder it will start off with 512 units step down to 128 step down to 2 uh, this I keep it at linear it just helps it a whole lot more if I have it at something else the autoencoder will try to basically one of the uh, features over here would end up being zero typically and I find that to be a huge problem for the purposes of dimensional reduction it's best to keep this at zero even though you might be able to get away with ELU or something else and I do the exact opposite sequence to step it back up I use Adam with half the default learning rate I have only stopping with a patience of 7 the store best rates pretty normal I have a validation split of 10% just for the sake of metrics I have a very small batch size and a very high number of epochs but that doesn't matter because I'll stop when I converge I have my encoder defined to model input comma get layer bottleneck dot output bottleneck is of course this point in which we have two future vectors in our neural network we have our embeddings which is just encoder dot predict x chain so I run this code and I found out okay we're overfitting a little bit but I'm not going to worry much about that I did test it with dropout but I decided to not bother with dropout so I predict with the autoencoder the x train, the x test, and I print out the dimensions. We indeed have two feature vectors, and I print out the first training, the second training sample of data. And main thing is, these two are integers. If this was to be a uh, ELU or something, so these are real numbers. If that was if there was to be ELU, then one of these could be zero. And in my testing, I found that actually this happened. So that's why it's best to keep it as linear. We run our benchmark without scaling because I found that scaling for PC2 was harmful, even though I couldn't show it above. above. And our PCAs and components should be equal to two. And I run benchmark with our x chain and our x test from our autoencoder we do not scale here either and we just print out a title to make it extra clear and i run this and i found that our autoencoder gave us a better accuracy and a lower log loss this doesn't happen all the time but this happened for the chain that i did so yes, I did arguably 
uh, for a informal grid search on the Wyndham seed, which is really a meme in academia, but this does show that it indeed work, even though it may not be easily recreatable, you just have to run your toy code a few times or figure out a more superior model architecture for this. Below I just have some random debugging stuff that doesn't actually matter. I just wanted to show that the number of samples here is 361. For a test it is 92-91. And if I was to predict my X string, I would get numbers that look like the following. And just as a closing note, I actually found that computing the mean squared error myself is actually very fast if I do it in this way, and it's faster than if I was to use sklearn. And if I was to compute it in my own naive classical double full loop type way, it would actually be relatively fast. So double full loop is much slower than sklearn, which is slower than using it, doing it by this way. And that it, that's it for the video. Uh, if you're interested in the way I present content and the fact that I always give code, uh, you can subscribe. Uh, I would appreciate if you could like the video, comment, share it with someone who may find this video actually beneficial. And my future content is going to be on anomaly detection and linguist, computational linguistics and EEG related uh, data sets. I'm also going to be talking a little bit about hidden Markov models, particularly how to do inference on inference with hidden Markov models from the chain data, meaning you do not have to define custom matrices, sorry, the correlation and when are the matrices which is typically a complete nuisance. I found a package each and I'm going to do this for us. And I'm going to have some videos on trivial anomaly detection using basic statistics and supervised anomaly detection on a network intrusion based data set. So hope you guys have good luck with whatever you guys are doing.